And whether you like it or not, whether you're saved or not, you are heading straight toward that battle. Every person on earth is heading straight toward the battle of Armageddon. What I want to do this morning is just clarify it. Now, beloved, I just want to say this up front. There's no way possible I can exegete everything I want to say to you. I am going to be painting this with a broad brush, I've told you, because I, I want to get some principles into you. Uh, I hope I can get it all in. I may be speaking a little fast, but I'm trying to traverse a lot of ground because I'm well aware of the fact that I'm on TV as well as here. And beloved, I can't tell you the people that have called me, that write me, that want to know the truth, that are asking me this, that have to, I have to write email after email, which takes an inordinate amount of time, energy, and effort, believe me. Now, those who love the truth are going to say, Amen, hallelujah. Those who are not are going to want to lynch me. So I'll be going out this door right after the service, okay? If you want to meet me, you can get out there, because I'm really going out that door. The Battle of Armageddon. I want you to open up your Bibles to Revelation chapter 16. Revelation chapter 16. And we're going to begin with verse 13, and we're going to read right through to verse 17. The Battle of Armageddon. What in the world are you talking about, Pastor Joel? I hear so much of it on the radio from TV preachers. What does it really mean? I hope I can clarify that for you this morning. And by the way, beloved, I want you to know this. This is one of the reasons we all need a church. We're all in this fight together. And these last days, you don't want to be a lone wolf out there on your own. You want to be with a community of saints that will be on your side. Amen? Amen. Revelation chapter 16 Beginning with verse 13, John says, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs. Now, frogs in the Bible were unclean animals. Come out or jump out of the mouth of the dragon, Satan, and of the mouth of the beast, the Antichrist, and of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils. Now, watch this. Working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world. Why do they do it? to gather them to the great battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold I, that I, that pronoun refers to Christ. Behold I come as a thief. Jesus said that in Matthew 24. Paul speaks about it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Now listen, beloved, you can't walk naked and have people see your shame unless you were first covered with the robes of righteousness. Amen? So you don't want to lose them. And he, that is Christ, the pronoun he's referring to is back in verse 15, gather them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue. Now notice he said in the Hebrew tongue and not the Greek tongue. In the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. Praise the Lord. The battle of Armageddon. Father in heaven, I pray, O oh God, as we consider this subject this morning, Father, that you'd give me total recall of all of the ground that I need to traverse. And Father, I pray you'd anoint the words and you'd open up the eyes of people's understanding. Not only who are here, those who are watching by TV, those who get the CDs and the DVDs, and Father, who will glorify Christ and show the importance of His church and people on this earth. Bring all things to my remembrance, Father. Anoint this preacher with Peter Clay, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The cryptic phrase, Battle of Armageddon, we've all heard it. It's been regularly used. Uh, by many throughout antiquity, and even right now it's being used in recent times. It has been commonly used to describe the Waterloo of all battles, as in World War I and World War II. Remember, those are the final wars that were supposed to end all wars, but they didn't, did they? Now that sounds good, humanly speaking, beloved, but the fact of the matter is, war is not going to end. Why? Because of the sinful, fallen, evil hearts of men who are political leaders in government. We've seen that on the news, and I don't have to elaborate on that. Amen? 
Jesus said there will always be wars and rumors of wars until he comes back again. He said these were the beginning of sorrows, not the end of them. So what are you saying to me, Pastor Joel? I'm saying we're always going to have wars. So uh, some even use this phrase, the Battle of Armageddon, to uh, try to uh, explain an expected World War III, a thermonuclear exchange of limited proportions that's going to kill millions on this earth, perhaps even destroy the earth. But beloved, I want you to know this, that's not what the Bible's talking about. That's what a lot of people say. That's what headline news says. says. That's what a lot of people who are into sensationalism say. But what say at the scriptures? What would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, there may be limited, limited nuclear wars. Uh, we expect it. Uh, in fact, we thank the Lord we've been praying for this summit that uh, Kim Jong-un and Donald Trump had in North Korea. Hopefully that will disarm that situation. But the fact of the matter is, this is not what the Bible means when it speaks about the Battle of Armageddon. Now listen to me, beloved. The Bible teaches it was God who created this earth, and it will be God who will ultimately judge and destroy this earth. This earth won't totally pass away and be annihilated. It will be renovated. Would you say amen? Now I want you to look at verse 16. He says, and he, Christ, gathered them together into a place called, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Now, beloved, the Greek word Armageddon is a transliteration of the cryptic Hebrew word Har-mageddon, H-A-R, Har-mageddon, that literally means this. Now, listen, it means the mountain of Megiddo. The root of the original world word means the hill of slaughter, the mount of rendezvous the mound of gathering and meeting place. And here it's figuratively used, ladies and gentlemen, to describe an event and not a geographical place or location as taught by many people today. It is to describe an event that is yet to happen in redemptive history. Would you say amen out there? Now, beloved, the problem for those who hold dispensational theology and eschatology is this. There is no such place in the land of Israel as the hill of Megiddo. None. The Bible speaks of the city of Megiddo. The Bible speaks of the river of Megiddo. The Bible speaks of the valley and the plain of Megiddo. But never does the Bible ever speak of any such place called the mountain of Megiddo. It is used figuratively. Would you say amen out there? Now hear me. Megiddo is not a mountain. Megiddo is but a flat plain, and it's located by the Sea of Galilee, and it's uh, between the Sea of Galilee and the Mediterranean Sea, and it's part of what we know as the Valley of Jezreel, or Estralon, that's some 20 miles long and 14 miles wide. Now, dispensationalists love to say Napoleon saw that, and he said this will be where the greatest battle will be fought. Well, for his day, it could have been. It was a great battlefield, beloved. But you're never going to fit all the armies of the world into that little area. You're just not going to do it. And I'll explain more as I go along. But anyways, beloved, what he's talking about here is this. Is that Megiddo, the battlefield of Megiddo, was once a famous battleground in the history of Israel. Now listen to me. It was at Megiddo, says Judges 5.19, that Deborah and Barak defeated the Canaanite kings Jabin and Sisera. It was at Megiddo, says Judges 7, 1, that Gideon and his little 300-man army defeated that huge Midianite army. It was at Megiddo, says 2 Kings 9, 27, that the zealous reformer Jehu, the madman, you remember him, who slew that wicked king, King Ahaziah. It was at Megiddo, says 2 Kings 23, 29, that the good but meddling King Josiah was needlessly slain by Pharaoh Necho's Egyptian army. The point is this, John here is using apocalyptic and symbolic language of a literal ancient battleground where many decisive battles were fought to spiritually describe the final decisive battle that will end this war at the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you say amen? Now, beloved, he is not using the term Armageddon or Battle of Armageddon to describe a literal battle to be fought at a fictitious place on a non-existent mountain in Israel. 
despite what dispensationalists claim and believe, and despite what all of these TV evangelists and preachers uh, and teachers, beloved, they come out and say these things, all they do is regurgitate what they've been taught as dispensationalists. But it has nothing to do with what the Scripture actually, literally says. And I want you to settle that in your mind, because remember, we're to be biblicists here. I have no affiliation with any denomination, none. I am not an evangelical Christian. I am evangelistic. Evangelicalism to me means uh, compromise. It means liberalism. It means charismata. It means all of those things that I am not. I am an evangelical, uh, an evangelistic Christian. <laughs> when I talk about a Freudian slip, amen? Now, beloved, I want you to get this. The book of Revelation is an apoc apocalyptic book. Are you listening to me? It's an apocalyptic book, and it's filled with signs and symbols drawn from literal Old Testament events his readers were uh, familiar with to spiritually represent prophetical events that would now occur in the New Testament in prophecy. Now, folks, John, in apocalyptic language, now figuratively, listen to what he does, he reinterprets and he reuses the main principles of these Old Testament events to convey to us the literal, spiritual, New Testament truths and principles he's seeing in his cryptic visions. He's trying to communicate these to us. And he's using terms that we can understand. <coughs> he's trying to describe the indescribable pictures he's seeing by symbolically reusing and recycling familiar Old Testament themes and events to try to describe the mysterious images he's seeing, beloved, in words that we can understand so we can discover the central truths of what he's really speaking about. So he's speaking to us in pictures like we would draw pictures. We see a picture of something. We don't think that's literally going to happen again. It reminds us of something that happened and the principle of it is it could happen again. Amen? Not the event's going to happen again, but the principle of it is it could happen again. So John is not saying that these Old Testament events he alludes to will literally happen again in the New Testament, but what they spiritually represent in prophecy will indeed be literally fulfilled. Oh, hear me now. Many Christians, many Christians do not know how to interpret apocalyptic literature like the puzzling cryptic pictures and images seen throughout the Old Testament in such books as the book of Daniel, or the book of Ezekiel, beloved, or the book of Zechariah. You cannot interpret those images, or the book of Revelation, literally. Have you ever seen a seven-headed beast? Uh, of course you haven't, beloved. Have you ever see, seen a woman standing in the sun, cl uh, clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet? These are pictures. These are figurative of something. Do you understand what I'm trying to convey to you? And so we need to understand. Why don't they understand it? Because all they know is dispensationalism by default. See, that's what's being preached today. Now, if, it's only about 180 years of age. The church historically knew nothing about dispensational theology as you hear it today. Nothing. Nothing whatsoever. They agreed with what we, we're going to teach. But you can see how brainwashed we've gotten today, and people have shelved their brains and shelved their Bibles, and they do not know what the Word of God itself has to say. And that's why Satan hates people who preach the truth. Utterly hates them. Listen, I've told my preacher boys, you get ready to preach. You get ready to fight Satan head on. You're going to meet him. You're going to really know what he's all about. You've heard about him theor theoretically. You've heard a few little testimonies. But wait till he really starts attacking you. I mean, he gets a hold of your flesh, and he gets a hold of your bones, and he gets a hold of your teeth, and he gets a hold of your computer, and he gets a hold of your house, and he gets a hold of your family. Wait till he does that, trying to stop you from putting together a message he does not want to hear. Why? Because it concerns his demise. He doesn't want you to know that. So you get ready for that. You see, beloved, most Christians are dispensationalists by default. They've simply embraced the popular doctrines and teaching of the Bible and, prophets and their prophetic way of interpreting the Scriptures because they say they do it according to a literal hermeneutic. Beloved, but when you study dispensationalism, and I was one, I got, my, I got a doctorate in it. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is, you're, you consistently interpret the Bible literally until it doesn't fit your belief, and then you turn it figuratively. So they don't even do what they practice, okay? 
So we need to know all about anthropomorphisms and anthropomorphisms and Hebraisms and all the rest of it, ladies and gentlemen, so we can really understand what the Word of God has to say. Because they, especially a lot of Christians today, really fail to understand the true meaning of Scripture or prophecy. They have a truncated look at it. And they rest it out of context and make it a pretext to try to make the text subjectively and sensationally say what they want them to say according to the latest headline news. So I remember when I got saved, and I have to be quick on this because i got a lot of ground to cover. I remember when I first got saved, beloved, this was in 1974, February 14th, 1974. The Cold War was still going on. Russia, the Soviet Union, everybody was preaching how Lindsay's books were out the late great planet Earth and Schofield Reference Bible was the Bible everyone was using, all dispensationalism. It's coming down. Russia's coming down into Israel. This was going to happen. And Reagan and the Pope took care of the Soviet Union. But you think anybody would call them a task? No way. People kept writing books. When we fought uh, against Saddam Hussein, they wrote, remember the books came out, Babylon, uh, resurrected, dispensationalist. And you, you don't want to be where Saddam Hussein is right now. And he's come and gone. So you can see, beloved, a lot of dispensationalists based upon headline news. If you see something happening in the Middle East, uh, because today we have cameras everywhere and social media, immediately you think, there it is, prophecy's being fulfilled. We see it right before I, they're putting it up there. And the dispensationalist comes out and writes a book about it. Then when it doesn't happen, he says, well, we just <laughs> made a mistake here. We, if it really going to happen, yeah, but this is what still has to happen. So we keep kind of stringing you along. But that's not what I'm going to do. You see, beloved, they only believe and repeat. And I'm talking about they, Christians today. What they've been commonly taught by dispensational preachers and teachers in the church. And listen to me, their eschatology and theology is primarily based upon popular widespread dispensational books and tapes and CDs and DVDs that espouse both the heretical and aberrational subjective teaching and theories about the end times and prophecy. And what amazes me is they're saying we're not going to be here anyways because we'll be raptured out. Well, what do you care if you're in heaven? I mean, can you imagine, beloved? That would be like me saying to you, listen to me, we're going to heaven today but boy, I'll tell you, we're going to have for the, until next week, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to keep preaching on prophecies uh, that's going to happen after we're gone. And, and this is what's going to happen after we're gone. What do you care when you're beholding the face of Jesus? You really know what's going on. We see through a glass darkly right now, but then face to face, would you say amen out there? So what am I saying to you? I'm saying most evangelicals, most Christians today, are unknowingly dispensationalists by default because that's all they know. I'm saying they are unknowingly pre-tribulation rapturists because that is all they know. Beloved, they are by default premillennialists because that's all they know, all their church had known. It was brought up from the evangelical dispensational schools and teachings and like a cancer it spread out especially through the seminars and things that they've had. Now, beloved, I'm not against dispensationalists. I love the people. They taught me to love the Word of God. I thank God, I thank God for every dispensationalist that loves the Bible, that believes in the cardinal doctrines of the faith, that will take a stand, a moral and spiritual stand for the conservative positions that the Bible talks about. But when it comes to their eschatology, when it comes to their theology, they are dead wrong, and I have to preach out against that if I'm going to give you the whole counsel of God, would you say amen? You say, Pastor Joel, are you fighting mad? No, I'm not mad at all, but I am filled with righteous indignation because most people are not prepared for the coming of the Lord because of those heresies. So you say to me, Pastor Joel, if, if, if they don't get it through an objective Uh, study of uh, an examination of the Word of God in church history, uh, then uh, how are they supposed to get it? They're supposed to get it through those preachers who do study it and who do preach it. Amen? Beloved, do you think, listen, much study is a weariness to the flesh. It takes a lot of time, energy, and effort to be a pastor, to be a preacher. It takes a lot of time. 
It isn't just diddy bop in, give them the basic gospel, whatever. What do you do? You've got to make them grow up from childhood to adulthood. You've got to disciple them. You've got to discipline them. You've got to be able to teach them. You've got to cry with them. You've got to counsel them. You've got to do all these things. And you've got to be there for them, even when you don't want to be. So, Pastor Joel, if the church for 1900 years, the historic Orthodox Christian church and faith never even heard of such a thing as dispensational theology is believed today, okay, what in the world does that have to do with the battle of Armageddon anyway, Pastor Joel? Well, let me tell you, beloved, plenty. It has everything because the scriptures teach that every person in this world, and especially Christians living in these last days, need to be prepared to suffer persecution, arrest, and martyrdom. Are you prepared? They need to be prepared to encounter the final Antichrist. Are you prepared? They need to be prepared, ladies and gentlemen, to withstand the great tribulation that's about to come on this earth. Are you prepared? They need to be prepared to endure the battle of Armageddon and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, beloved, what I want to be able to do is I want to give you a brief outline and an overview of these texts to help us truly understand and prepare for the coming battle of Armageddon. Now listen to me. There is a real fight coming for God's people in the last days. This is not just something that is theoretical. This is not something your pastor is made, making up. It is something Christians have historically believed and taught since the inception of Christianity, starting with the founder itself, the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, it's gonna, what I'm saying to you is this, is that many people in this fight, they are going to lose their families. Family will turn against family. They're going to lose their friends. They're going to lose their jobs. They're going to lose their homes. They're going to lose their lives. Did you hear what I said? Why? To stay true to the Lord Jesus Christ, which you must do if you want to grace the doors of his heaven. You see, beloved, I'm saying it's going to get terribly worse before it gets wonderfully better for the Christian. But you hear me now. You have to have your convictions screwed down tight. You have to know what you believe and in whom you believe, and you must live it. Would you say amen? If it started today, you'd say, thank you, Pastor Joel, and I see now. And I've been trying to prepare you and prepare you and prepare you and prepare your beloved, and I can't tell you sometimes what happens. Well, the first thing I want you to see is the spiritual conflict. Now, beloved, because of time constraints, it's not going to allow me to thoroughly exegete and explain all these texts. So I'm going to draw out some of the principles, okay? Because I want you to be able to understand that. Look at verse 14 and 16. For they, these frogs, these demons, are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Now I want you to drop down to verse 16. And he, Christ, gathered them together into a place called, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Now, scripturally speaking, beloved, Armageddon is symbolic. It's a symbolic word for the climactic event that will end all of human history and existence on this old earth. This earth is coming to an end. Armageddon is a figurative expression for the last great battle between the forces of good and the forces of evil that will close out this age. Armageddon is a non-literal, emblematic, linguistic way of denoting any decisive battlefield as those fought at Megiddo where righteousness ultimately triumphs over wickedness as right here in the final battle that will terminate this world. Listen to me now, beloved. This is what I'm trying to say to you. Armageddon is the word that denotes the grand finale. Armageddon is the word that denotes the final war. Armageddon is the word that denotes the culminating conflict between heaven and hell. Armageddon denotes the Waterloo of all battles that will be fought between Christ and Satan at the end of time. It will begin during the Great Tribulation, and it will end at the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you say amen? You see, beloved, what I'm saying is this. 
It's a symbol for the terminal war and battle between the cosmic rival kings of the universe. Who are they, Pastor Joel? Namely, Christ and Satan. Now listen to me. If I were to say to you, who is the opposite of Christ, you would say Satan. That's not true. Christ is the creator. Satan is the creation. Amen? The opposite of Satan really is Michael the archangel. It is not Jesus Christ, even though Satan thinks so. So I want you to understand that. Why this battle? This is a battle for the hearts. This is a battle for the allegiance and loyalties. This is a battle, ladies and gentlemen, for the allegiance and worship of men. This is a battle for the title deed of this earth. And who really rules and reigns over the earth? Is it Satan and this evil world system who is the prince and power of the air? Or is it the almighty Christ himself? Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved... What am I saying to you? I'm saying ever since Lucifer rebelled and fell from heaven and became Satan the devil, he has wanted all of the adoration. He's wanted all of the affections and worship of men that belong solely and only to God. Now listen to me. Satan is not a nice guy. He's a real person. He's a real spirit being. He is the arch enemy and the adversary of both God and man. Why? Because man, not him or angels, were ever made in the image and likeness of God or will ever rule this earth. Would you say amen out there? Satan utterly, utterly, utterly hates us. And he'll use everything from temptations to deceptions to blessings to money to everything. Uh, and that's why people look for green pastures, this, that, and that. Beloved, listen, that has nothing to do with God. Amen? When God wants you to do this, do that, or whatever, and green pasture, he'll give you the green pasture. You'll know if you're on a shadow of a doubt, won't you? So I want you to understand this, beloved. So what am I saying to you? I'm saying this. I want you to get this in your mind. Satan utterly hates God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Satan utterly hates Christians and Christianity. He utterly hates, now listen to me, the church. I'm not just talking about Christians individually. I'm talking about the collective body of Christ. Would you say amen? Scripture says that he is wroth with the woman. The woman represents the church. Why? Because the church is what keeps God's word, will, and ways in his salvation through Christ alive on this earth by proclaiming the good news of the gospel to spiritually dead men. And beloved, Satan does not want the gospel message to go forth to save and sanctify men that have been deceived by him. Why? So they can be damned with him in the last days when Jesus comes. See, that's how important the church is, the bride of Christ, the building of Christ, the body of Christ. And Satan does not want us to know that. And we need to understand that. Amen? Because he... He wants us to go in the lake of fire and hell with him. That's what he wants. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the battle of Armageddon, I'm telling you, symbolically describes the final cosmic conflict in battle. It's going to be fought by both spiritual forces on the battlefield in the invisible world between Satan's kingdom of darkness and Christ's kingdom of light, but also it will be physically manifested and fought here on earth in the visible world between those folks who are followers of either Satan or Christ. Remember, any battle that begins in the spiritual realm always manifests itself ultimately in the physical realm. Would you say amen out there? I don't care if it was World War I, World War II, the, uh, the Revolutionary War. Beloved, there's a lot of spiritual things going on and forces that are fighting before that thing manifests itself and people are being used as pawns to do the fighting. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but of what? Against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. What is he saying? Don't remember, that person that's in front of you, you can see, feel, touch with your tactile senses. He's not the real problem. It's the demon that's behind him that's trying to use him as his instrument to do the work. Put on the whole armor of God. Put that helmet of salvation on. Put the shield of faith on. Take the sword of the Spirit. Have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. That's what Paul said, how we're to fight the battle. Amen? So, beloved, what am I saying to you? I says, Jesus says to us that you're either with me or against me. You see, beloved, there's no neutrality or refusal to take sides in this final 
conflict and battle of Armageddon. Jesus said that except a man is born again, he cannot see, nor can he ever enter into the kingdom of God, either here in this life or hereafter in the next life. You must be born again. That's what he said. He didn't say you should be, you could be, if you want to be. He says if you ever want to go to glory, if you ever want to be forgiven, if you ever want to live in my kingdom, you must, you must, you must be born again. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there's none on the name of the heaven given among men whereby we must be saved, Acts 4.12, the Bible says. So you can see the issues are very clear here, aren't they? Now, we kind of blur uh, the Satan done everything through social media and what's going on around us and uh, our jobs and uh, our families and our friendship. All of this to blur what's really going on. And we need to open our eyes. Lord, open the eyes of my understanding. Lord, enlighten my mind. Illuminate my soul. Let me see as Christ would see. Let me see what you put in the Word. That's how we need to pray. You see, beloved... Jesus said you must be born again. Are you born again? If you're not born again, you're in essence saying reject Jesus. And this now automatically makes you a follower of Satan, the God of this evil world system, beloved, and not a true follower of God, no matter how religious you may be, no matter how safe you think you may be, beloved. What I'm saying is this. In your indecision to make a decision for Christ, you've now actually and consequently already made your decision for Christ by not making one. You see, beloved, you decided to be on the devil's side by default and not the Lord's side, and this will cost you your soul and eternal life. And a lot of people take that lightly, beloved, because they only operate through their physical senses and do not understand the deeper meanings of life. And I'm trying to give it to you here. So listen to me now. There is indeed, Jesus taught, a heaven to gain and a burning, boiling, bubbling hell to shun, and Jesus taught us that. Now, I want you to look at verse 14b, if you would, please. Verse 14b says, Which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Now, the great day of God Almighty. Notice that the battle of Armageddon is also called the great day of God Almighty. Why in the world would God say that? Because that's when he'll now judge the world. That's when he'll now judge the hearts of men. That's when he's going to shake you and he's going to find out who has real faith. Would you hear me now? You see, beloved, and that's when men will irre he will irrevocably determine the internal destinies of these people, whether they're going to spend an eternity with him in heaven or away from him in a place called the hell of the lake of fire. So the question is, whose side will you be on in that coming battle of Armageddon? Where will you stand with God Almighty in the coming judgment of the great day of God Almighty? Where will you stand? Listen to me now. If you won't live for him now, you won't stand or die for him then. You hear me now? Now, beloved, I'm telling you this. As someone who loves you, as your preacher, who's trying to get this off his chest, can have some rest. You hear me now? You don't live for him now. You'll never die for him later. Don't say I'll get in the middle of the tri tribulation, the battle of Armageddon, and then I'll perk up, and I'll go and do this. Oh, beloved, I want to tell you something, and I don't say this boastfully. I've been a martial artist since I was 15 years of age, and you know, I'm almost seven, never mind. And there's never been one, oh, I shouldn't say one day. I practice almost every single day, not for fighting. The fighting's gone. It's for discipline, for health, beloved, for awareness of the body, of the mind. To, why? Because if it ever happens, something grabs me. Even at my old age, I, I want to be able to survive the thing. Amen? But I wouldn't be able to, but I just said, you know what? One time, block, well, that's it. Every day, every day, breathing, breathing, focusing, concentrating, disciplining, truning, war, trying to learn how your body moves, how it acts, reacts, and everything like that. Why? Because I love it. But I don't love it half as much as I love the Lord. And beloved, I don't practice it half as much, a quarter of much, an eighth of as much as I study the Word of God. That's my primary focus in life. The rest of it, beloved, is temple tuning, preventative maintenance so I can get up here and preach to you. <laughs> Give me the strength so I can come up here and preach. Now, beloved, so we can conclude 
biblically that the coming battle of Armageddon is indeed symbolic language that graphically describes the grand finale of the ages-long cosmic struggle between both God and Satan. Now listen to me. I want you to follow me now. Don't lose me now. You pay attention. I don't, don't write notes, beloved. I don't want you writing notes. Get the CD afterwards. I need a little money anyways. Get the CD and listen to it and take notes off of that. Stop it and take notes. But I want you to listen to me. This spiritual battle, this battle began as a spiritual war in heaven when Satan was cast out to earth when he rebelled against God. Remember that? You can read Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28 if you want to. Thus, beloved, it continued throughout the, uh, excuse me, uh, it was a spiritual war then. Let me back up. But then it turned into both a spiritual and a physical or humanistic war for the souls of men here on earth with the fall of Adam and Eve slash man onward. Then it continued, beloved, throughout the whole Old Testament and with the children of Israel. God was always fighting against, I mean, Satan was always fighting against God people to get them to break the commandments of God, to not to live for God, to be swallowed up by this world like it is today. All through, the whole book of the Old Testament, beloved, read it, read it, read it, and you'll see it over and over and over again. Satan does not want God's people to obey the commandments of God, not want God's people to congregate together. He wants to scatter them. When the sheep is gone, what are they going to do with the, I mean, the shepherd's gone, what does he do with the sheep? He scatters the sheep. Why? Because, you know, a sheep all by itself can really be picked off. You take a coal out of the fire, beloved. When it's rolled up against all the other coal, it's red hot. But you take that one red hot coal and set it aside from the rest of it, what's going to happen to that coal? Is it going to burn brighter or go out? That's what Satan wants to do with God's people. All throughout the Old Testament and with the children of Israel. But then it extended into the New Testament and in the increase of the first coming of Jesus Christ and the establishment of his church and of the kingdom of God on this earth. But ultimately, it will soon reach its apex, its climax at the end of the age during the Great Tribulation at the Battle of Armageddon just before the second advent of Jesus. And beloved, when it comes, it will come quick. It will come unexpected. It will come hard and fierce overnight. When Reagan said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall, beloved, for 70 years of communism, we've been trying to get that wall torn down. And overnight, and no one ever expected it, all the pundits, all the experts, no one expected it. That's how fast this battle is going to come upon us. Are you ready? Are you prepared for it? I pray that you are. Because there's a lot at stake here. You hear me now? What's at stake is not your job or your money or your living quarters or your friends or your... What's at stake is where your soul will spend eternity. That's what's at stake. So, beloved, the battle of Armageddon is the fierce final struggle between the forces of God and uh, Christ and Christians on the one side, on the one side, fighting against Satan and his followers and demons working through people, now hear me, and human governments on the other side trying to wipe out Christianity from off the face of this earth. And I'm talking about real Christianity, not just people who profess to be Christians. They don't live it. They're not real Christians. Now there's three things I want to teach you quickly here on the point number one. Number one, the place it isn't. The place it isn't. The place Armageddon isn't. The battle of Armageddon, beloved, now listen to me, is an eschatological, that means a prophetic event, and not a geographical place and location. Unlike what's being popularly taught today, it is not a convergence of the armies of the world in the Middle East to fight against the nation of Israel. Now, ladies and gentlemen, sure the Holy Land will be involved because virtually every land throughout the earth will be on the scene for the last great struggle and battle. But let me tell you this. The Battle of Armageddon is not a northern confederacy led by Russia. 
It is not a southern confederacy led by Arabs. It is not an eastern confederacy led by China and Japan and Iran, all attacking the state of Israel, then suddenly being destroyed by God as being taught by dispensationalism today that's broadcast over the radio that all the people, they can't defend anything except that because that's all they know. You see, beloved, this is no, more, no mere military and political movement. Then what is it? It's the manifestation in eschatological history of the age-long cosmic war and struggle between both God and Satan and their armies of both angelic and human followers. Beloved, remember, I want you to remember this, folks. This is a war for the souls of men. This is a war for the loyalties and allegiance of men. You can shoot a man on the battlefield, kill him on the battlefield, whatever, beloved. You know what? You kill them physically. Satan knows he needs more than a physical. He wants the spiritual. What he's hoping is that God will not damn men made in his image and likeness along with him to hell. That's what he wants. So this is a war that's going to be a fought for your soul, for your allegiance, for your loyalty, for your worship. That's what he wants. Worship through government. Worship through the state. Worship through everything except for the Lord God Almighty. And remember, beloved, how do you show? Do I, do I have to show somebody I love them? Of course I do. I just can't say it. I have to show it. Well, it's the same way with God. You have to show it. So, beloved, the two titans of the universe are right now fighting for your soul. So that's the place it isn't. The place it is. Look at verse 14. Part B which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Notice, the battle of Armageddon will not be restricted to one locale in the Middle East, but it will encompass the whole world, the whole earth. The Bible says that God has a controversy with all the nations of the world, so the battlefield will be the whole earth, wherever God's people, wherever God's church is found throughout this earth. Beloved, the battle of Armageddon will be a worldwide attack on God's people by all of the nations who assemble for their last stand against Christ and against his rule and against his people and against his church. This is the battle of Armageddon. Are you ready? Are you prepared, dear Christian? I hope so. I hope I am. Boy, I'll tell you, it takes you prioritizing your life to see what's really important in your life, doesn't it? You see, beloved, they want to utterly annihilate God's people. Why? So they can cry out like it says in the Bible. They're saying peace and safety, peace and safety. The reason we don't have peace and safety is because of those Christians. They're always fighting against, against gay marriage, always fighting against, against tra transgender, always fighting against, against. Why don't we? Why do they go along with the program? Oh, beloved, you stand up and start standing for Christ. Listen, do you know why this preacher stayed in New England? When I was in seminary, they called New England the preacher's graveyard. Meaning this, that the average church in New England, Bible-believing, sin-hating, devil-stomping, pulpit-pounding, window-rattling, shingle-pulling, blood-bought, born-again, <gasps> Judeo-Christian church lasts less than five years, and God still got us here. And I've said to you since the inception of this church that Christianity in this country began here in Plymouth, and if it ends here in Plymouth, I want to be at the epicenter of it. How about you? We're all soldiers for Christ, the Bible says. And prove it. Get your training in. Find out how you're going to fight so you can learn how to wield the sword of the Spirit. And the purpose it involves, beloved, the real issue at stake here is not carnal. It is not materialistic. It's certainly not geopolitical. It's not wealth, but specifically spiritual <coughs> excuse me, and eternal. <coughs> and it concerns who you will worship and give your soul and your loyalty to, either Christ and his government or Satan working through the government of this world, this evil world system, beloved. Will the state now be your savior? Will the government now be your savior? Will this world now be your savior? Will the Antichrist be your savior? Now's the time to make that decision in your life. Who is your Lord? Who is your savior? Who is your king in life?
Now's the time to do it. Amen. So, beloved, that's the spiritual conflict. Number two, I want you to see the specific combatants. Look what he says in verse 16. He says, And he, Christ, gathered them <coughs> excuse me, together in a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Back up to verse 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out, the Greek says jump out, of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Now note who the disputants, the participants, the opponents are here, beloved. I told you there's a great fight coming, amen? Beloved, it's a clash between the two titans of the universe. Here's God and his followers against Satan and his followers, namely this whole wicked, evil, unregenerate world, the people and the societies in this evil world system that is led by Satan, beloved, that are opposed to God, they're opposed to Christ, they're opposed to God's people, and they are opposed to God's church. Right now, they're tolerating you, and I'll tell you why, and I don't have time to develop this. You'll see in Revelation chapter 20, God says he's bound Satan not to let the world come and destroy the church yet. But he's going to relift that restriction, that binding, at the end of the time. At the end of time. So there's a real fight coming in your life. So you hear me now? Now, beloved, let me explain some things to you. It will be the climatic battle between the Holy Trinity and the unholy Trinity that John cites here. That he cites here in verse 13. Now, beloved, the dragon... Who does he symbolize? The dragon symbolizes Satan working through all the governments of this world. He's called Satan the dragon in Revelation chapter 12. The beast. The beast symbolizes the Antichrist and all the confederate nations allied with him that will be led by him. Now there's a third person, the false prophet. Who does that symbolize? It symbolizes apostate Christianity and all the false religions and the isms of this world united together in open defiance and revolt and rebellion against God and His Christ. Folks, this unholy trinity is determined to utterly destroy and end God's true remnant church on this earth, whom John twice says they are the ones who keep the commandments of God and have the faith and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Satan doesn't care about the liberal church. Satan doesn't care about the nominal Christian. Satan doesn't care a whit about that. He's already got you. But those who want to live for Christ, those who want to obey Christ, that's the remnant, the little piece. Here's all big Christendom. But there's a little remnant there that really are true people. Satan says, that's the ones that I want right there. That's the ones that I'm going to wage war on. Those are the ones that I'm going to fight against. And by the way, those are the only ones that are going to be saved. I want you to hear that. You see, beloved, they obey the moral law of God summed up in the Ten Commandments. And they proclaim the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Satan knows that these folks alone are God's true church and people on earth because they have trusted Christ as their Lord and Savior and they live holy, righteous, and godly lives separate from this present evil world system. Paul says that in Galatians 1, by the way. Uh, uh, God says they don't get involved with that. They use it, but they don't abuse it. Amen? So God's true remnant church are not nominal Christians. They are not professing or lukewarm Christians, non-committed Christians, unfaithful Christians. God's true remnant church and people, ladies and gentlemen, are not apostate Christians or compromising Christians. God's true remnant church are not disobedient and liberal and backslidden Christians, beloved, who refuse to obey God's commandments or submit to his lordship or rulership over their lives. Instead, they rather go into the world, live with the world, live it up. That's what Satan's telling everybody to do. You don't know what you're missing. Go to the world, do this, do that, and everything like that, and you turn your back on God. And it gives you a worldly mindset and a worldly heart, and it leads you astray from God. The glitter and glitter of this world. Satan knows what he's doing. Amen? You see, the, these people, beloved, these backsliders, these compromisers, these liberal Christians, these professors, they're already the devil's own. And he's going to use them, by the way, to ruthlessly attack and condemn and persecute. He's going to use them to murder and martyr God's true remnant people. 
Jesus said they're going to think that they're doing God a service when they're persecuting you. That's what Paul thought, remember, when he persecuted the church? I preached to you about that several weeks ago. Number three, beloved, that's the specific combatants. Number three, I want you to see the sinister con artists. The what, pastor? Let me say it again. The sinister con artist. Look what he says in verse 15 of Revelation chapter 16. Uh, excuse me, what did I say, 15? I meant verses 13 and 14. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet, for they are the uh, spirits, evil spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them together to the battle of that great day. In other words, beloved, the unholy trinity, this evil trio, the great Babylon of the last days will use a global infestation of demonic deception and delusion and lying signs and wonders and all kinds of miracles to try to convince the governments of this world and the churches of this world to gather together to unite and fight at the battle of Armageddon against those Bible-thumping Christians who are nothing but fundamentalists. I might be fun, but I'm not dumb and I'm not mental, I'll tell you right now. You see, beloved, it will be because of demons. That's what's happening in the charismatic movement right now. Demon. Blasphemy in the New Testament, in Matthew chapter 12, is when the Pharisees attributed the miracles of Jesus, or the Holy Spirit, to the devil. In the New Testament, it is the charismatics today attributing to the Holy Spirit the miracles of the devil. That's what's going on. Beloved, I have specifically, listen to me, I don't have time to develop this. I've gone in my Greek New Testament to every time it talks about a paralytic, someone paralyzed, someone diseased, someone with a pestilence, and I can tell you this, no one is growing arms out today. No one is doing that. No one's taking people that are flat down, disabled, totally, no one's doing that. But they did that with Jesus' day and the Apostles' day. That's the real gift, not my headache's gone. Oh, I can hear right now. See, these are minor things. Satan can do that. That's the deception that's going on right now. So, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying this. The trinity of evil is going to use global demonic deception to persuade this new world order. This religio-political union and coalition of apostate churches joined with the state that the problems of this world are caused by these bigoted narrow-minded, intolerant, conservative Christians who love to wave their Bible everywhere and thump on their Bibles. Therefore, powerful demons will get the political and religious leaders and governments of this world to unite and wage war against God's true remnant church who are preaching the truth. How do you think Paul lost his head? Because he was lying? Because he was preaching the truth. Now, how are they going to wage war? I'll tell you how, beloved. Now, listen to me. Don't you miss this. You get this by enacting and enforcing evil and immoral and unjust and ungodly laws and rulings that they know true Christians cannot and will not ever keep lest they now are forced to disobey God's commandments. You see, that was the battle with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You will bow down. No, we won't. That was the battle with Daniel. Going to light. You, no, I will obey God before I obey you. But a lot of people are going to go along to get along, or they're going to run along. Amen? You hear me, beloved. I'm telling you right now that these con artists, this is what they're going to do. So this is how the stage for the battle of Armageddon will be set to try to both silence and annihilate God's true remnant church and people in these end times. Christians will seem like the troublemakers. We will seem like the agents of sedition and disharmony and disunity in this world because we will not conform to these anti-Christian laws like everyone else in society is going to do. So the battle of Armageddon, I'm saying, is primarily spiritual and a religious conflict that will be fought at the end of time. Now, beloved, I want to quickly take you to three scriptures because I want to get this on tape, okay? I want you to go, if you would, to Revelation chapter 13. 
just quickly, just back up a little bit. Revelation 13, verses 4 through 9, talking about the Antichrist. Verse 4, and they worship the dragon, that's Satan working through the Roman Empire at that time, and then the papacy, which gave power unto the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, who is like unto the beast? In other words, he's incomparable. Who is able to make war with him? In other words, he's invincible. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God. I'm equal to you. I have the same privileges and prerogatives as you do, says the Pope. I'm even called Holy Father. And Jesus only used that one time in his high priestly prayer in John chapter 17. He called God Holy Father. And someone has the unmitigated gall and audacity to say it. And 1.3 billion Catholics in the world don't even shoot the lips say anything about it. That's blasphemy, ladies and gentlemen. Now, now listen. And he says, and his tabernacle, and then the dwell in heaven. I explained to you in my series on Revelation. I can't explain it now. But this is what I want you to see. And it was given unto him to make war with the Israelites. Is that what it says? To make war with the saints and to overcome them. And powers given him were over all kindreds and tongues and nations. <coughs> Excuse me, uh, beloved. And he, all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. Now that doesn't mean they're going to bow down and worship him like that, beloved. They're going to give their loyalty. They're going to give their allegiance to them, to the state, to the government, to the anti-Christian laws that are going around. Well, I gotta go. I've got to live, you know. I need, I need a job. You know, it sounds good, doesn't it? Because you don't know what you have. You've got nothing in your life you die for. You, should, you don't even deserve to live. Verse 8, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. But I love what he says, If any man have an ear, a spiritual ear, let him hear. Jesus said what the Spirit hath to say unto the churches in Revelation chapter 1. Now, beloved, you can see that this war is against the saints. Now go over to chapter 17, if you would, very quickly. Chapter 17 of Revelation. And I want you to look at verses 13 and 14. I, I'm sorry, I, I, beloved, I have to, I'm going to go a little longer. But I, 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 believe me when I tell you, this is of the Lord. Two weeks before this, I can preach to you. My wife will tell you, God woke me up and gave me this. And I said, I didn't want to preach it. But I have to. And I'm going to. And I can't wait to finish. <laughs> Chapter 17, beloved. I want you to look at verses 13 and 14. And these, that he's talking about is the beast and the ten horns, have one mind and shall give their power unto, and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the Lamb, that's Jesus, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is King of kings, he is uh, Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and uh, 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 committed or faithful. I'll try to keep it in C for you, okay? Now, Beloved, one more text. Go over to chapter 20, because this is the Battle of Armageddon is mentioned three times in the book of Revelation. Here he comes, chapter 20. I want you to see what he has to say in verse number 10. Begin with verse number 10, beloved. And the devil that deceiveth them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. Oh, excuse me. Let me back up. Begin with verse number 7. And when the thousand years are expired, that means at the end of this age, not a millennial in heaven, uh, you know, a thousand years. These are symbolic words, beloved. It's amazing how people will take all the symbols and interpret the symbols. Then when it comes to the thousand years, their denomination and theology says interpret that one literally. Why don't you be consistent in the way you interpret the Bible? Let God lead you where you need to be led. He says that when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog. That recalls Ezekiel 38 and 39. That is all of the nations of the world that are now gathered against the church of Jesus to gather them together to battle, the uh, number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints. I can't develop it, but I've taught you Revelation chapter 13. It recalls the children of Israel that camped in the wilderness around, uh, around the tabernacle, beloved. The camp of the saints is the local churches universally spread throughout the world. You hear what I said? Not the local Christian here or one over there. Or one over there. The churches that are the ones that are on the front line of this. Amen? So he's going to come against the church about and the beloved city. 
We are called the New Jerusalem. We are the city of God on this earth. We are the temple of God on this earth. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Praise the Lord. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. In other words, beloved, you can see that the primary targets that Satan wages war against is not the children of Israel in the Middle East. He wages war against God's true saints on this earth. But praise the Lord, we know the gates of hell cannot prevail against God's church. The dragon, the beast, and the false prophet will ultimately be thrown into the lake of fire. But listen to me now. They'll do a lot of damage to the church before they go. You may have to seal your faith in your blood, but you're still going to glory. So, beloved, that's the sinister con artist. Now I want you to see the second advent. Go back to Revelation 16. I try to keep this as short as I can, believe me. It, it, this is the hottest sermon I've ever prepared in my life. In, in almost 40 years, the hottest sermon I've ever prepared in my life. Revelation chapter 16, beloved. Look what he says in verse 15. This is Jesus speaking. Behold, I, Jesus, or Christ, come as a thief. That means you're not expecting it. It is sudden. Blessed, happy, fortunate, to be envied. The Greek word is meno. That's what that word, blessed, is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments. Why, Lord? Lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Oh, beloved, this is the blessed hope of the church, the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? And here Christ gives God's true remnant church and people both an exhortation and also a warning. Now let me explain that. He exhorts us to longingly and expectingly watch for His return by looking at all of the prophetic precursory signs that He said are going to precede His second advent. Are we seeing them today? Beloved, let me tell you, the gospel going forth to all the earth, Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, and this gospel shall go forth as a witness to all the earth, then shall the end come. Also apostasy in the church. Is that happening today? Liberalism in the church, compromising in the church, heresy in the church. Is that happening today? You see, beloved, this is to give us hope, to remind us that he's indeed coming back. And he's coming back to rescue and deliver us in the battle of Armageddon. So he wants us to persevere in the faith and overcome all the enemies in this life. Either we do it with our life or we're faithful unto death so we can receive the crown of life. Would you say amen? Paul says, I am now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the righteous judge shall give me in that day, and not to me only, but to all those also who love his coming and his appearing. You see, beloved, I don't know about you. There's something in me that always wants to fight. I don't mean fist fight. There's something in me that doesn't want to quit, that doesn't want to give up, that steals my spine, that gives me sand that I want to keep on keeping on. I hope you have that. No matter how hard it gets, and it's going to get hard. It's going to get much harder. And there's not going to be any place you're going to be able to run. You're not going to be able to flee to the mountains. You know, people saying, get out of the city, flee to the mountains. Oh, beloved, good night. Why don't they read the Bible and study the Bible? You see, beloved, so he exhorts the saints to be ever alert and watchful and diligent, lest they too be deceived and destroyed along with all of the wicked at the battle of Armageddon when Jesus comes back to end this world to culminate human history. But notice Jesus warns and cautions us also. Not only exhorts us, but notice he says, keep our garments. What does he mean? That is, we are to keep the robes of righteousness that he gave us when we got saved. We're to keep them clean. We're to keep them free of the stain and pollutions of sin and Satan and this evil world system in the last days. That's what he's talking about, beloved. In other words, we're to morally and spiritually be faithful and loyal and steadfast in our convictions and our character and our conduct in the spiritual battle. We're to remain wholly loyal to God and his commandments, beloved. That's what it means to keep your garments. 
those robes of righteousness God gave you. But then notice what he says. He didn't end there. He says to walk naked. What does that mean? It means to lose your robes of righteousness he gave you. Righteousness to justify you. Righteousness to sanctify you. Righteousness to protect you against compromise and apostasy and God's judgment. Lest when he comes, both he and the whole universe and world see the shame of your sin. See the shame of your betrayal. See the shame of your disloyalty to him in following the devil and his evil world system. That's what it means. Keep your garments. You got garments? Keep them. Don't lose your garments. A lot of people are setting them aside for the fodder of this world. Number five, I want you to see the sinful conquered. I want you to see verses 18b through 21 of Revelation 16. 18b. It says, And there was a great earthquake, such was not since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city, that's Babylon, this whole religio-political economic system of this world, divided into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell. Now notice, did it say one city fell? You know what that means? That means that Boston's going to fall. That means New York City's going to fall. That means every city, everywhere, and every continent, every country of the world is going to what? An earthquake that has never been seen before fell in great Babylon, came in remembrance before God. And I'll tell you, if you read the Old Testament, this comes from, especially the book of Jeremiah, God says, I am wroth with Babylon. I am furious. I'm fed up with her. And he says, to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away. How many islands fled away? Every island. I'd like to know who's going to be here to occupy the millennial kingdom, huh? And the mountains were not found. Can you imagine the Andes, the Alps disappearing? Oh, well, just on the news tonight. We'll go on. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. Beloved, just a cursory reading of Scripture reveals how God in the past has used his almighty power and all of the weapons that are at his disposal to be able to judge people and nations. For example, now, beloved, I challenge you to read the Old Testament. I, I challenge you to do it and keep reading it. In fact, I told you I've gotten sick of reading it because it's the same thing over and over again. But you're never going to know what God's talking about unless you read it. Now, what are some of the weapons that are at God's disposal? Well, God uses hail. Right here, he's going to use weight of a talent. That means 100 to 125 pound hailstones. Beloved, listen to me. I can pick up, even at my age, 125 pounds. I used to be able to press it with one hand. I used to, there's a certain way of doing it. But you try to take that and put it in a little ball and try to lift it up. Now the weight's not distributed. You see what I'm saying? Can you imagine them coming down from heaven with the accelerated force and power they have, slamming in the houses, slamming in the cars, slamming in the men, slamming into everything on this earth. Can you imagine that? Can you picture it? Well, that's what he's talking about here. And God has used earthquakes. We've seen that on the news. Floods. God uses lightning, media showers, war, famines, droughts, disease. The Bible says God uses pestilences and hurricanes and volcanoes. God has used fire and brimstone like he has at Sodom and Gomorrah. And God has used mutiny, beloved. You know, as you read the Old Testament, you'll see that often in the confusion of war, God has made his enemies turn on each other and kill each other. And they've never even realized that it was really God that was behind this all fighting against them. They just started shooting and killing one another, sword and <laughs> You see, beloved, but it was God. In other words, the battle of Armageddon is going to end in a fiery conflagration and inferno. Everything and everyone on this earth except God's true remnant church and people will be utterly burned up. It will be a very great slaughter. These are the Bible words of the unsaved people on this earth who have gathered together to fight in this climatic battle of the battle of Armageddon that will now close out this age in human history. In the end, God and his followers are the winners. Satan and his followers are the losers. And they all end up in the lake of fire. Amen? I'm saying that in the 
and God and good triumphs over evil. And Christ and his people are the ultimate victors in this final showdown, this final contest that concludes with this fierce and relentless age-long battle, what is coming up, known as the Battle of Armageddon. Beloved, Christ the Lamb defeats Satan the dragon. He did it on the cross, and now he's going to do it at the consummation of the age. Colossians 2.15 says, And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. In Colossians 2.15. On the cross, Satan was defeated. Now he's just been on kind of a suspended sentence till God executes the sentence. So I'm saying Satan the dragon, the beast, the false prophet, all of those who follow them will be cast into the lake of fire. And lastly, beloved, and I'll make this quick, num number six, the sure consummation. The sure consummation. Look what he says in verse 17. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. Let that resonate inside of you a little bit. What did God say? It is done. What is done? In other words, it means that God's redemptive and re retributive plan for man has now been completed just how he planned it himself in the dateless, timeless eternity past. Amen? You see, beloved, these same words, it is done, are also uttered by God a second time in Revelation 21.6 at the recreation of the new heavens and the new earth after all this is done at the second advent. When God creates the new heavens and earth, he's going to say again, it is done. In other words, didn't I say I was going to do this? Didn't I promise you I was going to do this? Didn't I want you to watch for this? Watch what I'm going to do? I'm not a liar. I'm not a cheat. I'm not trying to trick you. It is done, is what he's saying. You see, folks, this recalls what Jesus said in John 19, 30. At this first advent, as he died on the cross, as our sacrifice, our substitute, our sin bearer, to pay the penalty for our sins and purchase our redemption so we could live forever. As before he dropped his head into his chest, the Bible says he mustered all the strength that he had, and he said this. Now, look at me. I'm not trying to be dramatic. I'm trying to share what Jesus did. His Jesus, imagine, his throat is parched. He's lost a lot of fluid. He's been whipped, beat. And he says, Tittletestii! It is finished. And the Bible says he dropped his head into his chest. And he dismissed his spirit. He gave up the ghost like a king would dismiss a subject from his presence. Oh, don't you love the harmony of the word of God? You see, beloved, now he says at the battle of Armageddon, it is done. Dad, the plan is finished. Now let me conclude. This whole world, everyone in it, is ignorantly and obliviously heading pell-mell into a collision court with its creator and redeemer, beloved. This whole world right now is judgment-bound. The battle of Armageddon, the day of judgment, will forever settle the issue of where your immortal soul will spend eternity in either heaven or hell. So the question is, whose side are you on? Are you on the Lord's side or the devil's side? Oh, listen to me. Whose army are you really in? Who is your commanding general in this life? Is it you? If it's you, that means you by proxy because Satan's really commanding you. And that means he's your general. What does it mean for Christ to be Lord of your life? A lot of people want him as Savior. You can't have him one way or the other. See, Savior means I'll accept Jesus so I don't have to go to hell. But I'm never going to submit to him. I'm never going to obey him. I want to, you see, I know I'm supposed to be a follower of Jesus, but Jesus, you need to follow me. No, the Bible says you need to repent. You need to turn around and stop following him. Not leading him, following him. Amen? Isn't that what the Bible means? Well, beloved, who's your general, Christ or Satan? Will you be a triumphant victor or totally vanquished at the battle of Armageddon? What say you? What say you? 
So, beloved, this, folks, is what the real battle of Armageddon is all about. The battle of Armageddon will conclude, close, and climax this world at the end of time. And I assure you, it is coming quickly. That's the battle of Armageddon. Let's go to the phone.